Live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us, everyone. How you doing? Welcome into the program. Uh, I hope that all of you are doing well and you are ready for today's program. So today on the show, we have none other than Mike Cermak. He'll be joining us here in just a moment. And hey, you know, we're going to be talking all different kinds of uh, news, rumors, things like that. And uh, hey, you know, we're even going to have a little segment here dedicated to, well, uh, small business owners and managers and, uh, you know, how working remotely, uh, let's see. So there's, uh, things like call forwarding, there's different products and services that can help you work remotely because, Hey, it turns out, uh, if you're having a problem transitioning from, you know, let's say a home life or, uh, an office to a home office, uh, someone out, someone else has probably had those problems before as well. So uh, yeah, we'll have all different kinds of things to talk about. But before we do, ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything, including the show notes for today. You'll find uh, past shows, future shows. You'll find videos, the podcast. Um, anything that we talk about will be included in the notes. And uh, yeah, find us on social media. So I think with that said, uh, we're just going to go ahead, bring Mike on, and you know, just have fun with this because it's Friday. Uh, you know, the the ravages of coronavirus are still happening. And hey, you know, we need a little levity. And, you know, to kind of kick that off, we'll talk about, well, how, um, you know, Zoom is malware. But hey, it's going to be fun anyways. So, Mike, how you doing? Welcome back on to uh, Computer America. Not bad, not bad. Um, I, we, we discussed the uh, thing before. But other than that, hey, we, uh, you know, we're doing okay. So with, uh, <sighs> yeah, I, it's, you know, and as far as perspective goes, I, I mean, these are so, I'm sorry, these are such, uh, unprecedented times. Like I've, I'm, I'm very, very old. I'm 29 years old. It, it, it has really the, the, the ravages of time have taken their toll. And I got to say that, you know, even when it comes to my parents and, you know, uh, people even older than them, uh, you know, it's, uh, something like this hasn't really happened before. It's like a really condensed version of change. Oh, and just one moment. I hear you, but unfortunately, the uh, the people don't hear you. So let me start over that, and then uh, we'll go ahead and uh, say that over again just for everyone. Uh, try now. No, 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 not that one, not that one. I, I And again, this is something that we were messing with uh, beforehand, and I thought I had it all. 
is working from home today and it's just <laughs> yeah i guess it is so there we go and uh yeah you, everyone should be able to hear you now so start yeah. over again uh you have, testing you, one two three all yeah, right great no you're, you're good yeah, so, so i was just saying speaking of of you know how different things are now that i've got a friend of mine who's 94 years old he remembers you know living through the great depression he served in world war ii and he was saying how this is unlike anything he remembers living through before that in the great depression people would go to one another's homes and and share with what they had and be able to be with one another but the isolation part feels really strange to him and, and it's just something like no one has ever lived for lived through uh before and it is it's it's trying times it's it's difficult i i and and of course now i think that we the the, the fundamental difference because the last time something like, like this happened uh you could say you know something like um swine flu or bird flu that happened but even back then you know even when it was happening in the early 2000s, uh, the mortality rate was, you know, less than that of the seasonal flu. Um, right. So very infectious, but of course, you know, very from, isolated areas that really, yeah, yeah. And and I, I got to say that you know you may be able to compare it to something like um, the, the Spanish flu back in the early like 1901 or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And um, when you compare it to that, the main difference, and you know, this this is how I'm going to breach it into technology. The main difference is that we live in the information age. Uh, you know, we live in a day and age where, you know, I, I you know, I have a friend that uh, her, her mother, uh, she continuously looks for information. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not saying that it's, it's kind of the demographic, you know, just kind of, um, that dem- that age demographic, they're looking for information. They get, they turn to social media because it's their friends, it's people that they trust, and the amount of stories and I can't say that word on the air BS that float around <laughs> on social media. Yeah. Um, there's pros and cons to everything, isn't there? Th- there 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 should be so much reputable, good information being spread, but. I think the information age has taken on the idea that it's not just about having all of the information at your fingertips. It's about having lots of different information from different sources. And it's up to you to kind of figure out what's good information and what's bad. And like, that's the difference is that we know more than the average person did during Spanish flu, but we also know less. Yeah. Yeah. And that's true. The one thing that I like to remind ourselves of is that we're living in a day and age, though, where while we have to be this isolated, that, you know, we can do FaceTime and and live chats, you know, with my kids and my parents and, and, you know, we can still see one another. We, we did a game night the other night where we're doing games virtually over the internet. And, you know, it's, while it's isolating, and I can assure you that being home and trying to work with three kids is very, very frustrating. <laughs> It, it could be worse. Like, I can't imagine. There was this poem I found uh, of, of someone with um, uh, scarlet fever uh, when they were isolated back in, you know, whenever that was. Yep. And, and that, you know, they couldn't even send mail because you know, no one would take their mail. And as isolated as we feel, it's really not as bad as it could be. And for people who like me who don't mind, you know, sitting in front of a computer all day anyway and not seeing people yeah it's kind of a <laughs> yeah. best case scenario really it's like there oh, no, there's I can't go outside there's a certain subset of, of people <laughs> that are actually thriving in these uh troubled times and <laughs> i gotta say though that uh, and, and again another thing that's kind of off off topic but video game companies uh a lot of them are actually you know kind of going above and beyond i know that um you know let's say a lot of companies are like offering further incentives they're you know kind of and and i guess they know that you know hey they have a captive audience uh right. literally but they're you know they don't have to offer you know kind of free rewards and free this and free that to kind of you know hey uh further incentivize you to stay distracted and uh play video games and a lot of new video games have come out recently um i'm not sure if you're big into vr but uh one of the big ones was of course uh, uh half-life alex came out not too long ago oh hey you got uh what is that the uh que- no Google, this is, uh, uh, yeah, the Google. That's one that you slip the phone into. Mm-hmm, yeah, that's exactly what it is. That's not going to do me much good for the games you're talking about. No, 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 no. But, <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, uh, Half Life Alex came out not too long ago, and, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's it's a very interesting time of video games, and I think a lot of people are suddenly finding themselves with a lot of free time. So, yeah, they sure are. It's it's. Yeah, I don't know what else to say about it. I, I, I you know, <laughs> and, and of course, uh, you know, just to uh, one more little topic, and we talked about this yesterday with our uh, correspondent, Scott Schober. Um, 
man, pretty much all business and, and, and you know, uh, your, your day job, uh, other than of course, techguy.org, uh, your day job is installing, you know, uh, network infrastructure and things like that and tech support. And really, I, I mean, almost everything here for Computer America, I went through my email, selected, uh, you know, be, be, you can do filters, search for everything with coronavirus, virus, and um, COVID-19, and about 80% of my email went uh, to the yeah. trash can. It seems like every, it seems like if it's not related to, to coronavirus, uh, it can bugger off. It, there, <laughs> There is nothing else to talk about. Yeah, well, and, and it's the opportunity for every company that you've ever communicated with to send you a message because you're so eager to learn exactly what they're doing as a result of the COVID-19. I was wondering how Instagram was handling this. That, right? that, Boy, uh, I, I couldn't sleep at night before finding out my message from Intel that don't worry. Yeah. yeah the, every, well, every company has to, has to hit you up with that. But what... what so, so real quick, what was Intel's message? Here's one virus that we can actually stop. <laughs> no, I don't think that was it. No. Okay. Okay. Well, and, and, and I say that because there have been some recent vulnerabilities with Intel and uh, all of them seem to be kind of hard baked into it. And, and really, you know, just to chase the tangent, uh, Intel just came out with their new mobile processors. I'm not sure if you caught that, uh, Mike. And, no, you huh? know, yeah, and, and of course, the mobile processors are for laptops and things like that, uh, not so much for cell phones. They're able to get 5.3 gigahertz on their top of the line best mobile processor. Um, eight core, 16 threads, 5.3 overclocked. Um, very, very impressive. Like they've they've really pushed. And what's the, the power usage on that? Uh, still keeping the four, uh, the 45 uh, uh, TW whatever uh, power wattage whatever. Um, 45 watts is still really what nice. whatever it is. or uh, a twd I, I i think is total wattage draw or whatever um so yeah they're able yeah. to keep that down 5.3 but here's the thing um they're still rocking the 14 nanometer architecture and people are really starting to get on their case because you know it was on their roadmap five years ago to get right. off of the 14 nanometer architecture two years from five years ago <laughs> uh, right and here well, they my are math isn't that great but well, and the math works out too. They're about three years <laughs> over schedule, and they're still putting out projects uh, or right. I'm sorry, products on that architecture. Right. Um, it, you know the uh, the incremental increases that we're seeing. You know, like the ten percent from Intel, year over year, it's great. But yeah. hey, you know, I've I've been waiting so long for them to shrink it down to ten or even seven, like AMD is currently doing. So yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, and it's just a matter of time, but I think they want to make sure they get it right. They don't want to have the bad press of trying to push something out before it's ready. And you, you can't blame them for that. And with the way the world is at the moment, I suspect they're moving all resources to trying to meet the demand of people buying processors right now, rather than the R&D of whatever the next thing is. We've had a lot of customers in my day job where you know everyone's working from home now in the whole world. And so I had a customer call me Wednesday and order 23 laptops, which is a big order for us. Yeah. <laughs> and I had the hardest time finding a vendor who could still supply me with 23 laptops. I mean, we have you know a, a series of, of different companies we work with that we're signed up as resellers for, but it, everyone in the world is buying laptops right now. So I imagine Intel's you know demand for processors is <laughs> well, and not many people are caring about the the ten versus seven versus fourteen right now. Yeah, yeah. That, well, and well, I am, and and gosh darn it, <laughs> I'm going to die on that hill. But I got to say that uh, the the executive, um, uh, the uh, the overlord of, of Alphabet slash Google, um, uh, Sundar, whatever. Um, and, and anyways, um, he said that. They're having a hard time filling the orders for graphics cards and GPUs and stuff like that because yeah. they said that data centers are just uh, exploding. Heating is not a good up. word. Um, re <laughs> heating up, uh, I guess, is a much better word. Um, but, but yeah, the, the demand for not just the ability to have these online services, but for the companies in the backbones for, between Amazon Web Services, Google, I'm sure Microsoft is the same thing. Um I can't imagine the the load and the, how well the internet infrastructure is just kind of handling this. That is true. I mean, there have certainly been wrinkles here and there. I know Comcast had some outages here and there, but mm -hmm. but it's been the exception more than the rule. I mean, it's really been 
working very well. And all of these ISPs have been lifting their 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 caps, caps their data yeah. caps, and nothing has broken yet, <laughs> which makes everyone wonder. Like, wait a minute, I thought I thought you couldn't have unlimited internet without everyone. It's like the data caps kept the network stable, and you know when right. a lot of people use it, and then now right. they're like, a lot of people need to use it. We're lifting the caps. It's like. <laughs> Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we're all going to pretend like oh. that didn't happen. But data cap argument aside, I, I got to say that uh, I, I, I think that the entirety of Europe asked Netflix to throttle video. Like it's yes, now, I it, did see something like that, and I don't know how much that was really necessary. Or, but, but I guess why not be be more careful? But. Well, and, you know, back in the day, Netflix was this unoptimized behemoth where it took up like 30% of the uh, of the internet bandwidth, but they've come a long way when it comes to optimizing packet and, you know, really uh, well, condensing and people things. people don't realize, uh, apparently by a, a recent report, it's still 15% of, of all data over the internet is through Netflix, which is kind of amazing. But what people don't realize is most of that is not going across all of the internet like if i am sitting here in pennsylvania and watching um, uh, tiger king which i did <laughs> uh, i am not streaming that from you know from from california for example that's coming from some local in fact because i have comcast comcast has their own caching server from netflix mm -hmm. that sits in their database i mean in their data center so i'm not even streaming that out over the internet really i'm streaming it all the way from here to the closest data center from comcast and it's not even going out through their pipes uh so it's it's a little bit misleading by that and i think people expected that to be more of a problem than it is because they have such a great infrastructure put out that you're you know, telling me you're telling me that that the uh, the, the legislators and policymakers are attacking kind of just the the biggest person in the room as opposed to the actual issues. I got to say though See, that it's a series of pipes, Ben. I, yeah, a, ser a series of tubes, a series of dump trucks, oh, tubes. and You're right. All right. tubes and dump trucks and cats. And I got to say though that um, when it comes to Netflix and 15%, by the way, uh, I, I I think that's a an amazing number for them because consider yeah. back in the day they were 30 with a lot less customers now they have a lot more customers serving a lot more information and they've shrunk it by like half very right. impressive um so and, and the last thing i will say about netflix is that it's not netflix's fault all of you out there listening you're the ones who asked netflix to send the data netflix isn't just hogging the data for no reason you're asking for it so well, there and is there anything more important that could be going over the internet tiger right king now looks so king? i mean interesting I, I, that's the the highest and best use of the internet right now is tiger king and tiger king related memes i uh, the memes have been amazing I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure that you saw the cow that that they painted like a tiger cow no, I didn't see the cow. I'll pull that up on the video portion. Absolutely, but, uh, we need that. Real quick, I I, I got to say though, the only thing I know about Tiger King, I've not seen it yet. But what? Uh, so, what someone, are you doing on the radio? You need to. <laughs> but someone said, someone said that when the drug kingpin is the least interesting person on your on your show, you know it's going to be a good documentary. <laughs> so it is fascinating. That is for sure. It really was pretty good. So there you go. And oh, and by the way, I found it. So uh, let's Google images. So let's see if I can do this without. Um, yeah. So here we go. I'll throw that up there. And here's two gentlemen who, uh, well, <laughs> dressed up as the characters from the show. And here is, of course, a cow who was painted. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming using hair dye, it was not cruel to the cow, but I uh, love the internet. I just love the internet. Yeah. Just, yeah. They did a really see, good job. At of least that. even during these difficult times, at least there are people out there who can, you know, do something silly and, and bring joy to everybody. Do you think some, and, and do you think someone was like sitting at Netflix and they were like, now is the time. There was no better time for this <laughs> We've documentary. We've been sitting on this stupid yes, documentary <laughs> for years. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I'll bet that that's what happened. I don't think that that was the scheduled release date. I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe it was just well, a happy coincidence. But my it, goodness, it was a great timing for for that. So you know, for those producers for that documentary. So, so this is interesting, and we can actually turn this conversation in some weird way back into one of our stories. And this is one that you actually provided. Um, and uh, I love autoplay videos. Thank you, CNET. But uh, this one from CNET and the U.S. box office. Speaking of streaming movies and videos, because obviously yes. people are consuming a lot of media, they're just not allowed to go into public places. And that, of course, means that uh, this article that you have here, I found it very, very interesting. Because... 
uh, you know, just a little while ago, I said, this is a period of rapid change. Uh, you know, just you had the Avengers last year, you had so many big blockbusters, you had Frozen 2, which I think made like $18 trillion uh, in, in like the first weekend. Uh, <laughs> movie, like the movies and movie theater and box office numbers have never been higher uh, until this virus. <laughs> No, they weren't. (laughs) The U.S. box office made just $5,000 in the last week of March. And I think that's just because they were checking the cushions for dimes and quarters uh, (laughs) because no one was sitting in them. How did they make $5,000? That's a good question. I, I I don't know the answer to that. So IMDB has this service called Box Office Mojo where, where they report this. And you can go back and see that domestic. So for the U.S. Uh, office weeklies, you know, in the, for example, March 6th through 12th, they brought in $134 million. March 13th through 19th, they brought in $58 million. And March 20th through 26th, a lousy $5,000. It's also interesting to see the number of releases along there. You can see the the releases. You know, went from 100 a hundred uh, a week to ninety eight to seventy three to two. two. <laughs> I, and and whoever released those two, they're just like, eh, oh. you know, this this was for fun. We're going to be the number one movie this week. <laughs> that, that is actually something that could be true. Uh, number one at the box office uh, on, on release. That's um, you know, I I, I could have probably put out a movie and done that. So there you go. Um, but, yeah, but yeah, so that is crazy and crazy scary. I, I the change, the change, and it's interesting to see how they've switched the releases from from box office to home movie. Yeah, you know, we watched Onward. We we rented her that here at my home from for mm-hmm. the kids to watch, and and I think it's a great idea for them to do that. And my initial reaction is, oh, that's a nice thing for them to do for everybody. And then I realized, oh wait. They, they, they actually need to do that. <laughs> that's not that's not a gift. That's because they're trying to survive. Well, and and really, uh, you know, you mentioned three kids, staying at home, that kind of thing. Uh, even on a good movie night, let's say that you did want to go see a, a kid's movie. Um, you know, that's three kids, that's out, that's dinner, that's movies, that's uh, all the frustration. And, of course, if you, you know, even if you didn't, you had to get a babysitter and that kind of thing. Right. Um, it's a lot of money, and I think that the scheme that they're working on is a 48-hour pass. I'm not sure if this is what uh, Onward or uh, uh, no, we, uh, we rented that one specific. Oh, oh, I don't recall what it was. Something like that. I think you had five days to start it, and once you started it, you could only. I don't remember what it was. Well, and, like and I know that uh, Paramount Pictures and things like that. They've been floating ideas around of twenty dollars, and you get it for 48 hours after you watch it. And um, after that, it goes away. But hey, um, you know, twenty dollars is more than a single movie ticket. But if you're buying a movie ticket, let's say for three or four people, uh, right. it actually comes out to less. And on top of that, hey, you get to stay at home and watch the latest movie. Here's um, the problem. Yeah, I-, I miss the movie theater popcorn. One of my <laughs> primary reasons for going to the movie theater <laughs> is for that butter that turns my veins into. I don't know what. But you know, I bet you can I find miss, a I, I genuinely miss it. Movie theater butter uh, buy. And I'm sure that they sell it in drums because it's probably <laughs> industrial. It's not. I had a friend of mine when I was in high school who worked at the local theater. Yeah. And he said, you know, once you've seen the drums of the butter, you'll never use it again. And I was like, mm, nope, I don't think that would be the case for me. I'm, I'm pretty sure I could. <laughs> It, it, it's almost like um, um, watching how they make like the like let's say the gas station hot dogs or, or something like that. Um, you don't want to know how it's made, but hey, right. once in a while it just hits the spot. You know, it, oh, it's something that sure. you want. Well, and here's the thing: I'll bet you I could get drums of it, and I'll bet it's at a reduced rate right now because ain't no one buying movie theater drums of pop or of, of butter right now. They're yeah, all I, shut down. I could get a bargain. I could probably get a truckload of it for half off. Well, and and actually, I'm I'm actually looking at it here, and they're selling it on Amazon of of all things, uh, twenty two bucks. So hey, you know, if you want to go do that, how big of a drum uh, is it? Like fifty gallon or? Uh, it's actually like a gallon. Like uh, it, it actually looks a lot like cleaning fluid, but uh, <laughs> probably uh, similar chemical makeup as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but but there you go. So uh, yeah, there, there's the whole experience of the movie theater, and that's something that uh, movie theaters were relying on uh, up until this point. Is yeah. that hey, people can stay at home, watch movies in the comfort of their own home, but you miss the experience, and that and, you know, movie theater across the country were improving seating they were improving you know kind of the atmosphere they were putting out better food right. um but i hey. will say I, I, I are we allowed to give stock advice here 
uh, sure. No one, no one follow this, but sure, go for it. <laughs> so, uh, Cinemark Holdings, who owns a bunch of the theaters nationwide, mm -hmm. went from a stock. Uh, let's see, they were at thirty-two dollars back on February twentieth, and today they're at eight dollars. What a bargain! <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. They're not making any money for a long time, though. But I, but it I, seems I, like but because even once this lifts, so suppose three months from now, six months from now. Mm -hmm. I think fewer people are going to be going to the theater than did before for a lot of reasons. I think people will still have a residual worry about it. They won't be as comfortable with it. I think the economy downturn is still going to be slow. So I, I'm, I'm not saying it's necessarily a great buy right now, certainly not for the short term, but it's just fascinating because that is a huge difference. I mean, 32 to eight is not, is, is huge in so, stock to drop like that in a month. So, and, and of course, you can look at a number of other uh, industries that are doing the exact same thing. Uh, again, don't follow any stock advice that we're talking about. But uh, if you are, if you're really comfortable in thinking that cruise lines are going to come roaring back, right. um, man, cruise lines have taken such a huge hit because they've been turned from hospitality, uh, uh, kind of, vac you know, luxury cruise vacations to uh, petri dishes, and yeah. uh, it's just not a good look. So yeah. there, like I said, periods of rapid change. Uh, a perfectly good company at forty dollars, and I assume good company because I don't know anything about them. Down to eight dollars. <laughs> uh, very, very impressive. And of course, um, back to the original point, which was maybe this is the entry into the people who don't want to go to the movie theater, but the you know they if not the same day release at home, uh, maybe after the opening weekend, they would start to, you know, kind of release it into people's homes faster. Mm -hmm. That might be something that comes out of all of this. And do you think that's something that would last beyond this, this time? You think in a year they would still offer something like that? So, and, and the, I'm actually on the mailing list for the, uh, for like the, the, the nation's movie theater association, whatever there, there's actually like a union that, of that exists, there is. of course. And the organization is, uh, they were pushing against that. Like, even though they all closed their doors, uh, you know, by force, like they, they had to, it's just the right thing to do. And they were forced to by all of the different States. Um, they all pushed against this idea of releasing unreleased movies in theaters into people's homes because they knew that that was Pandora's box. Um, so they're very much against it, but I, you know, keep the price high. Don't make it cheaper than movie theaters. But I think for a convenience standpoint, because really Mike, I, even though you like the movie theater, how many times have you seen a movie trailer and said, well, you know, that's good. I don't want to go out, but I'll wait for it on Netflix or or I'll wait for it on a streaming service. Yeah, uh, definitely. It might fill in that gap of I yeah. really want to see that in theater and I'll wait until it's out on streaming. Yeah, I think that we will see that have something like that happen where there'll be more in-home cinema stuff like you said maybe not immediately right after release but but shortly thereafter. Like one or and two I weeks. Think that yeah. There will be yeah, I I could see that and and perhaps even a membership thing where you have to pay a premium for I don't know. I, who knows what they would work out. I could definitely see that. Um but I think that we will see a lot of things like that come out of this whole pandemic event and quarantine event. I, you know, a lot more people are working from home. There's a lot more doctors who are doing, you know, remote visits, you know, uh, you know, over, over FaceTime or, or other video sharing uh, programs. You know, I have a, a, a very small doctor's office. I think they have two or three physicians in it. I've never imagined that they would ever do any kind of remote, you know, uh, medical uh, thing and mm -hmm. I got a phone call from them a couple of days ago saying hey your next visit you know next month just so you know we're going to do that via video chat chat and I was like wow all right cool and they were asking you know, they were there was a pre-call to to screen you to see if you had the capability of doing that and I was like heck yeah I don't want to leave the house but <laughs> but stuff like that I wouldn't be surprised if once people get used to it that even a year from now that you know more of that will become available I think that will help push more people into being accepting of those sort of technologies just this Monday, we had on the Sargon Dental and Implant Institute. They obviously work on teeth. And uh, the, the gentleman there, you know, we asked him how technology was, you know, kind of changing the, the, the tooth industry. Uh, you know, obviously, the tooth fairy is now in a Tesla, uh, the, the new Tesla truck. She's the first one to get one. So there, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, he is played by Dwayne Johnson. That's the tooth fairy is Dwayne Johnson. Uh, 
Yeah. So with with that being said, though, um, they have now scans that they can, of course, scan your whole mouth, your teeth. And if you need some kind of major reconstructive cosmetic surgery, uh, he actually operates on uh, like the digital image in, you know, kind of like in like virtual reality kind of deal. And he can come up with like surgeries for other dentists to kind of follow along with. So he can perform the surgery at his studio or his uh at his office in Los Angeles, but then, um, and like record the surgery and then dentists all over the world can then follow kind of the tutorial vi video that he shoots with exactly your teeth and exactly your mouth and actually do it offsite. Um, that's happening and how today. long do you suppose it will be before they have a robot able to do that? Where you they, already, have the they already have it. They, they, right. he, he already talked about that as well. They kind of strap it onto your face. Uh, and, and you know, a, a lot of a lot of uh, chains and straps just to hold you still. <laughs> All right. I don't like that part of it. <laughs> and who said the doctor's office was scary? But uh, working from home is definitely something that's happening. And, hey, uh, more entertainment in the home. I think that you're right. After three months uh, of, of this whole quarantine thing, people are going to have a renewed appreciation for going out and being around people, you know, yeah. and kind of just. So there may be some of that. You're right. So maybe we'll see a big swing the other way. I'm, I'm kind of predicting the opposite. I think people will be slow to, to resume normal life. As not, we know. not a full we'll swing. Have a nor new normal. N not, not an overcorrection, not a full swing, but it will go back. But at the same time, uh, Pandora's box. As soon as people say, hey, the technology exists that we can watch blockbuster movies in our home, uh, you know, uh, like legitimately, that has to be a key one, legitimately, and, you know, it can be delivered. Why? Because let's face it, in the 90s, if you wanted to go to the theaters and see uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, that wasn't an option in your home. There were, you know, they weren't shipping VHSs to people's homes a week after it was released in theaters. Right. Uh, everything's digital now. We can do this. Uh, it's just a matter of the economics and should we do it and that kind of thing. Uh, it, and it's going to kill some industries as a result. There's going to be a lot of major shifts. Like, you know, movie theaters will be very different if half the people start watching at home instead of going to the theater and buying my, you know, $13 bag of popcorn. Well, and, and uh, you know, there's always the theater uh, such as uh, I, I've not been to yet. I plan to an Alamo Draft House. Uh, people talk about them all the time and they play old movies. They play movies that aren't exactly blockbusters. Uh, and they're like community centers. They play, you know, they have like weekends with like themes and they serve alcohol, which I think is a big part of their business, uh, <laughs> being a draft house, of course. Mm -hmm, yeah. But they, um, you know, they, they've turned a movie theater from just this place that you go buy popcorn with grease on it, which is very, very good. And you sit in a room with a bunch of other people who are screaming and laughing and interrupting your movie experience. Uh, they've turned it into a completely different kind of experience. And that's what's going to happen is the people who don't like the movies, they're going to stay home and watch movies their way. The movie theaters are going to have to cater to those who appreciate the entirety of cinema yeah the, the experience and yeah i think you're probably yeah. right and again it's just gonna be a lot of things are gonna be changing and it's something we need to they have karaoke nights they say in the chat room that's that's something different in a movie theater that's yeah it's uh, hey, i guess it's more of the draft house than the movie theater it's gonna be combining different industries to try to draw one, people out you want the experience right you mm -hmm. don't want just to watch the movie you want the experience one of the coolest ideas i've seen for a, a birthday party back in the 2000s Really, when Halo, what, what was the the big thing? Uh, one of my friends rented out like their own movie theater, and I'm sure that you know there was one to rent. Um, but yeah, they, they rented out like like the not the entire, but just one screen, and to the projector they connected an Xbox and they played Halo uh, up <laughs> on the on the entire thing, uh, four person split screen. And that is awesome. Yeah, you know they all took turns. It was, it was a birthday party. There was food and drinks and that kind of thing, and they played Halo. Um, on the entire you know, on a huge movie theater so you know ideas like that and that happened back in the 2000s cool. um hey i think you, know, you could rent a theater really cheap right now <laughs> you could get the whole place and uh yeah you'd you'd be, you'd be by law the only one allowed to be there so <laughs> with uh with that being said i'm looking at some of the other stories and i unfortunately can't find a good segue but i did want to talk about zoom because we talked about it 
a little bit yesterday um, with some of the issues that Zoom is having. Uh, for those you don't know, Zoom is like the replacement to Skype. Zoom has really taken the industry by being convenient. It has a lot of good features. It's very intuitive. The interface is very, very good. Uh, but hey, it's come under some criticism for some of its backend practices, some of how it handles your data. Um, is it encrypted? Uh, is it malware? Which is a question that I did not ask before. <laughs> I, I got a laugh out of that. So there's an article. Who's that by? Um, the uh, Guardian that says Zoom yeah. is malware. And they're quoting someone there, which it's a, it's an exaggeration. It's something yeah. to catch your attention and it worked. And certainly Zoom is not malware. Now, there are, so there's a lot of criticisms. One of the big things with Zoom that they made some headlines. I remember a couple of days ago, I read an article about a politician somewhere in the Midwest that was running a town hall meeting and all of a sudden someone jumped into the Zoom meeting and had pornography streaming in place of, you know, where their video would be. I've heard and that a I couple times. I thought about doing yeah. that during our, our video today. I'm I glad thought, you know. didn't. <laughs> I'm but glad you thought the, again. The, the, pro <laughs> the last time Mike was ever on Computer America. How many years have I been <laughs> he on? Just, he went out like, with a bang. I don't know if I can say that. No. But yeah, oh, there you wow. Go. That was good. Wow. <laughs> All right. Um, so anyhow, um, so the, the problem with it is, is many, most of which I think is that people just don't know how to use the software. You know, people are, are jumping into it for the first time. They have no experience using it. Didn't bother reading the information. They, they share it to everybody and, and open it up to everyone and don't realize they have the capabilities to moderate it and to kick people out. And as a result, in that particular case for that town hall meeting, they just shut it down altogether. Yeah. They didn't even know how to just remove that person. And it's just, I think part of it's just the adapting to, to learn how these tools are used. I don't think it's anything specifically against Zoom in this case. Um, yeah. Now, yeah. Oh, go on. Oh, well, and, and and I I did want to say that Zoom as a company, I I ha they were not on my radar at all until about six months ago. Um, I don't want to say that I was an early adopter. They've been around for like nine years, but oh, yeah. uh, I was definitely on board before all this happened. So I do want to say I'm cool, but... Uh, I, I got to say that a lot of companies out there when they first start, and um, I, I'm not sure how much you know about, you know, kind of the startup culture, uh, Mike, when it comes to tech companies, but if you don't integrate with either Google or Facebook and make it really easy to just click one button, automatic installation, automatic setup, um, you know, you're either A, kind of alienating some people who are saying, I don't want to give this company my stuff. I, I'll just give them my Facebook stuff, which is the same stuff, but that's besides the point. Anyways, there was an article saying that Zoom was sending your information to Facebook and they since removed the API. Although to me, I'm like, as soon as you see that logo saying sign in with Facebook, you know, with just one click, I was like, of course, they're sending everything to Facebook. That's what that one click button means. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's for any website. If you do the one click login for any website, then that they share some information with Facebook as a result. I mean, that's just kind of how these things work. Which is so weird how they got in trouble for that. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, Zoom is, you know, they have some legitimate things to talk about, including the fact that they're not strictly end to end. I think that, um, that, so I, and, and I never really got a clear answer from that. I, I try to look into a couple stories about what they mean by not end to end. I think that when they transmit data through, you know, through the different servers and things like that, that's encrypted, but kind of, it's not completely end to end. Like it's kind of decoded. And if you have access to, I guess the system, you can read the data. So like, let's say if you have Facebook running in the background on your phone and you're using zoom, Facebook would be able to know that you are using zoom on that phone. Right. Um, so I think that's what they got in trouble for. Yeah, and well, and and trouble isn't even the right word. That's what people got upset about. But that's how these things work. Like if you're going to authenticate through a third party, that third party knows that you are authenticating. Like that is that is how that works. And yeah. the other thing is is so there and there's lots of uh, uh, other um, arguments in here. The there's things like there's in-app surveillance measures that. Uh, for companies that use Zoom, that there's an attention tracking feature that the person running the Zoom meeting can know whether or not you still have that up in front of the, as the top window, or if you're out browsing and, and watching Computer America when the meeting's <laughs> running in the background. Right. And, and people don't like that because they feel it's invasive or privacy or whatever, but it's like, well, that's a feature they're selling to business. Like, I, I, that, that was a feature that was already available when I was in high school and they were, um, you know, teachers were able to monitor all, yeah, that's right. And it's all the same kind of, of thing. Like, 
can you really be mad at Zoom for developing a feature that its customers clearly want? Like, yeah. I, and Z it's not as, I don't know. that. So that didn't bother me at all. Yeah. Z you Zoom can make an argument about maybe my, my business owner shouldn't be doing that. Maybe they shouldn't turn that on. Maybe they should trust me. But I don't think that's Zoom's fault. I'm sorry to step on you. No, 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 no. You're right. It's uh, it's it Zoom. It's Zoom's responsibility to kind of put in uh, features that its user base would find, uh, you know, kind of useful. And I think that if you're hosting a meeting with like a hundred different people, you're not going to be able to kind of you know look at their face and say, uh, yeah, they're probably you know paying attention. They're nodding and they're you know kind of doing their thing. Uh, having an automated system to do that completely makes sense. So stuff like that. Uh, let's see. So in-app surveillance metrics, that's what you were just talking about, selling user data. Um, up until this point, like Zoom, Zoom was kind of chugging along. They were a multi-million dollar company. They were, they were providing a product. Uh, but at the same time, for any tech startup out there, um, so many tech startups out there start with venture capital money. And I have no doubt in my mind that Zoom is the exact same way. And if you're a venture capitalist, you know that, hey, you want a return on your money as fast as possible. One of those ways is to sell data. And to think that any service out there that you use for free, and Zoom does have a free option, um, yeah, they're going to collect your data, and they're going to package it up, and they're going to sell it. I, I, it. This whole article seems, like you said before, people are outraged by it, but should they be surprised by it? Right. I, I think it's making a mountain out of a molehole and... <clears throat> Pardon me. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it also is that Zoom is kind of the only or one of the few winners in this whole scenario that we're playing out right now. That And going back to stocks, Zoom is one of the stocks that are actually doing pretty well compared to everyone else because so many businesses are relying on it right now. And so they're an easy target for people to pick on because they're the ones who are doing well. I, I don't know. The, the only one that kind of caught my eye a little bit was about the encryption, that they don't really have end-to-end -end encryption, and apparently they claimed at one point that they did. And it doesn't mean that the, the, the conferences aren't encrypted and aren't secure. Mm -hmm. It just means that it's not end-to-end. -end. So that means technically it's possible for Zoom to stand in the middle and be able to watch the video and listen to the audio of your conference, which some people might assume that they could do anyway. But if it were true end-to-end -end encryption, they wouldn't have the capability. And there are chat cap you know, programs out there that do that where, where you can't. Right. But <clears throat> Zoom can't really do that for a number of reasons. First of all, they offer options like being able to record your video and mm -hmm. that would be difficult or would have to be done on the client side if they didn't have, you know, if they had true end-to-end -end encryption. But then you also have things like the telephone option. People can call into Zoom conferences, which is not encrypted. Telephone system is not like, and there's, you know, could they do a little bit more than what they're doing now? Yeah, probably. But it is encrypted between you and them, which is really the important bit, which is the same thing as when you go to Amazon, your credit card information is encrypted between you and them, but then they can see your credit card information. Like that's, you're, right. you are trusting them in this process. That's. They, they, they definitely have this. Uh, and, and of course, you know, uh, we use Zoom here. We're actually using it right now. Uh, not, not paid, not sponsored, anything like that. But uh, I actually do really enjoy the service. And I, I got to say that, that that they uh, they allow you to record to the cloud, you know, so you can back up your entire meeting on the cloud if you want to, you know, kind of maybe reference it later and things like that. And I got to say that when, when it comes to, you know, kind of recording it and offloading that kind of thing, that's where encryption is not going to work. It When you said that they're blowing this out of proportion a little bit, it seems like Zoom has said, you know, we have passwords, we have PIN numbers, we have uh, authentication, we have unique links that you can send that are one-time use. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they have all these different ways to kind of keep your uh, meeting secure, but then everyone's like, but wait, what about this, this, and this? And they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to work on that. It, it's it's They, they have 95% of it covered. 5% definitely needs to be addressed, but... You know, and I don't know that they're any worse than any other one that is out there. I mean, there's there's Skype compromises for, for if, if you're sharing video and audio with people. I mean, then allowing yeah. these extra services. Yeah, S Skype for I think about ten years. Let anyone who asked know your IP address. That caused so many problems <laughs> with doxing that, like, if you ever accidentally open Skype on your computer and someone was like looking and got your name. Uh, yeah, you, you, they could find your physical address within minutes. Um, 
that kind and of thing Zoom has, has been announced that yeah and stuff like this happens and zoom has announced that they have, have through this pandemic and everything that's going on because of the enormous new additional use that they're having mm -hmm. um that they have you know put pa press pause on creating any new features the development of new features they're focused entirely on scaling and on security and people are saying well yeah good uh, you know about time but i think they're doing <laughs> a pretty great job because the scaling that they've been able to pull off here in the last couple of weeks where I, I don't know the numbers, but I've got to imagine the number of users and the the per minute you know use of their service has got to have skyrocketed over the last two weeks. You know, there's I I know for example my my kids' school is using Zoom. I I know my sister in law school is using Zoom. She's a teacher. I know you know businesses that have been using Zoom forever and new ones that are using it now who never did before. There's uh, you know politicians. There's community groups. There's everyone is is connecting and and there are competitors. I don't want to say Zoom's the only one out there. You know, WebEx, for example, is one that comes to mind, owned by Cisco. And but but this, I think they're doing a pretty good job. That's what. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and, and, and you're you're absolutely right. And by the way, um, you know, speaking of stocks, uh, Zoom is Z M, and then there is another stock symbol called Z O O M, which is uh, a completely different organization and a completely different service. Uh, their stock price has also gone up due to the confusion. So yeah. So over the time that the other one got caught. <laughs> cut down to like 20% of what it once was. And you know, the, now they're going the other direction. Yeah. And, and really, and, and I like to point that out because I think it's funny that, you know, Hey, algorithms and even people uh, can make that mistake. And it, it's kind of like back in the day, uh, Mike, and by back in the day, I mean like three or four years ago when um, let's see, there, there was uh, what was the big trend for like stocks? It was like not machine learning, but if they added, um, uh, like uh, a crypto, uh, the, if stocks added like it was like there were, there were certain key phrases like crypto to their name. If they were <laughs> uh, if they were ham sandwiches crypto, their stock price would just sky uh, uh, automatically no, blockchain. Go up. It was blockchain. Oh, there was a, you're right. There blockchain. was a brewery that actually changed their name to uh, you know so and so brewery blockchain, and their stock <laughs> went up like two hundred percent. Um. Yeah, people make mistakes and people just kind of jump at what they don't know. So I always find yeah. it funny when people mix it up is, stocks. Well, and that is the interesting thing with the stock market is how much of it is just done automatically now. A lot of it, a, a lot of it. And they, and you know, um, that's why they said that these crashes it's and these wild computers. swings are so rapid is because computers are feeding off the volatility. So, right. But hey, that's its own, that's its own thing. Let's, uh, yeah, we have plenty of time. Let's switch over a little bit into. You know, and because, hey, we've been talking about coronavirus, uh, Google real quick. And I, I think I covered this one uh, a little bit and it had to do with using location data and but it wasn't about Google. Uh, Mike, I'm not sure if you heard about this. Uh, National Health Services in the UK, they're, yeah. they're, those are all the hospitals. Th the UK government, in partnership with the NHS, were considering having an application on your phone that would activate the Bluetooth. And as each person kind of goes throughout their day, uh, it would continuously monitor where you went, what train you took, what bus you took, what office building you stayed at. Uh, using Bluetooth, it would ping other people's cell phones near you, uh, co collect their contact information, and it would leave a trace with everyone who you interacted with and they, you know, the UK's version of the CDC said that something like this is drastic, but it would be very, very helpful that let's say if person, forget that, let's say person Ben uh, contracted coronavirus or, or something like that. And then they could just hit a button and say that, hey, you were around someone who who has this virus, you are at risk, or if you were right. uh, near them for, for a prolonged period of time, you are high risk come get checked out or if you're low risk you know isolate yourself for 14 days and everyone else can kind of go about their lives but it would all be done automatically and it's kind of related to the story that we have here with google but man when i covered that story i was like that would be super convenient um mm -hmm, yeah that would be awful that would be orwellian that would be uh -huh, right horrible. it's a lot of things isn't it uh-huh yeah, yeah. But it would be, that, but but it would be convenient, yes. And, and I believe there is a. I think China's doing the same thing. I think they have an app on their phone that that does the same thing and, and warns people when they've been in in close contact with someone who then becomes um, 
Um, in fact, it, yeah, yeah, or or that's Compromise? not the word I'm for, but yes, yeah. Um, who, boy, it's my brain's just not firing at all cylinders today. <laughs> but anyhow, yeah, and I, but and, and that's exactly it though. Is it's it is Orwellian. It is you know the sort of thing that people point to China and say, ah, oh, we don't want to be like them. We don't want the government to know every move we make. And then they can do things like, well, you know, you've been in close contact with someone. Now you're locked down to home, and now you're going to you know forcefully going to be checked for this, and now you're not allowed to you know, use public transportation anymore. Now you're not like you could see how that could roll out even more for the benefit of the greater good, arguably. Mm -hmm. um, but there's there's a fine line between freedom and and the benefit of the greater good. So I don't know. So you, then this article, that. this article, Google uses location data to show which places are complying with stay at home orders and which aren't. Uh, and, and this is, again, uh, using information that I think a lot of us freely give up. We uh, I know, think most people give up without even knowing that they're giving it up. That too, and even if they do know, uh, you know, such as myself, I'm like, well, yeah, Google wants to know where I'm logged in from. Uh, they say it's for security purposes, uh, you know, so they know that if Ben logged in from North Carolina, uh, you know, hey, that's fine. And then two hours later, he logged in from Bangladesh. Uh, that might be a security issue. Uh -huh. That might if, raise a flag. Right. Yeah. Things like that. And, and of course, they're 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 collecting my location data to do that. Um, but now they're using it for different purposes, such or they could be using it for different purposes, such as this. Is that right? Eh, that's the conversation. Well, and and I think in the agreement, you give them permission to be able to give out statistics, you know, that are in mass like that that can't be um, identified specifically with someone. Uh, that um, what's the word for it? Whenever it's well, I tell you, my brain is fried. It's good thing <laughs> metrics for the end. Yeah, yeah, just generic metrics numbers that that have been you know used in mass that you can't identify someone individually in it. And it's interesting because in these reports, if you go in, you can choose your state. Yeah, I went to Pennsylvania here and overall it says in Pennsylvania, retail and recreation is down 50% compared to the baseline. Grocery and pharmacy is down 27%, which has not been my experience when I had to go to the grocery store. So Parks they're just giving trends. They're yeah. just giving trends, right. And it's interesting, they give you a graph for each one. And then they also break it down by county. So I can go down here and find my county here in Pennsylvania and see that you know, transit stations are down 21%, although there's not enough data for this one because there's not a lot of transit stations here in my county. You know, parks you know, are down this. And uh, it's, and, it's and, fascinating. And it's cool to be able to dig into it. Absolutely. And it looks like here you have, uh, oh, oh they, they give you PDFs. Um, yep. You know, we pick on America so much. What's Canada up to? So retail recreation down 60%, uh, grocery pharmacy down 35%, parks. So Canada seems to be doing the, the, the quarantine pretty well as well. So and of course residential is up uh fourteen percent. So pretty As good. Be. Yeah. Pretty good candidate. And and if you keep scrolling, it breaks it down even further into you know different small oh, yeah. geographic areas, which is is the more interesting bit in my I got you. Uh, British Columbia, you enjoy your parks. I'm glad it's beautiful out there. So with uh, <laughs> that and, and uh, yeah, so we'll definitely include a link to this article and being able to see all that kind of data. Uh, not as intrusive as, of course, you know, kind of narrowing it down to a person, but uh, it's the aggregate of all the data that aggregate. we freely get. There we go. It's the aggregate of all the data that we freely give up to then say, hey, here's <laughs> here's what the data right. can really show you. And so I think what we're saying is we trust Google to know where we are at any given time, but we're not sure if we trust our government. Is that is that what we're saying? Uh, and hey, uh, <laughs> how closely do the government and Google communicate? Um, well, and there's that balance as well of, of give and take. So in, in exchange for giving Google my information, I have the benefit of traffic data and Google Maps, and I can go to my Google uh, history and, and all of that and additional security, as you mentioned. Yeah, and, it, and, giving up that data allows me to easily stream something from my computer or my phone to my TV right. uh, because they know I'm on the same Wi-Fi network. All the network. pictures I take, I can easily search by where I took them. I can yeah. say, hey, show me all the photos from when I was outside Ben's house, and it'll just pop them right up. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> but now with uh, so so yeah, and of course you give up a lot of data. So something like this would be possible. Um, but I I don't think anyone's going to be you know kind of wary of Google of this. Um, and hey, maybe it could provide someone with uh, decision making powers some useful insights. So there you go. Um, yeah, we have like five minutes left. And of course, uh, we did talk a little, a little bit about the Grubhub with the $250. People are ordering in more. They're giving kind of forceful dif uh, uh, forceful deals and discounts and sales. And the restaurants just have to comply or forego the order completely. Um, 
things like that. That so that's that story. Um, real quick, let's see. So the other one was um, the iPhone SE twenty twenty. Next time you're on, we'll we'll talk about the new Deal. iPhone. And this is, by the way, the the spiritual successor to the iPhone five C. I, I think was the last time they kind of made like a like a I don't want to say like a budget phone, but like a C for a, cheap. Yeah, a a, a a less expensive phone that had, instead of like an OLED, it just had an LCD panel. Uh, it was a bit slower, lower storage, but at the same time, it hit it's a price affordable. point. Yeah, yeah it, 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 it hit, I'm sorry, it hit a price point that uh, Apple just normally does not go for. So uh, next time you're on, Mike, hey, we'll talk about that. So yeah. with that being said, uh, I did want to dedicate this last five minutes to just broad strokes overview of... Hey, you're doing an online talk for two local chambers of commerce. What the heck? Why? And what are you going to talk about? <laughs> so they came to me. They're working together and trying to find ways. I'm a member of both of them through my business. And uh, they came to me because they're trying to find ways to support local businesses. You know, the major issue through this pandemic is that, you know, the big businesses will likely survive with you know some exceptions. But the smaller businesses, uh, some of them are paycheck to paycheck anyway. So having something like this happen. Uh, I think some of my business customers may not make it through this. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's a scary time to not have income for a month if you're a small business owner. Uh, so, you know, how to work from home, some uh, from the technical uh, side of things. And some of the things that I was talking about is working remotely. I've had so many customers contacting me over the last week or two, trying to suddenly set up to be able to work from home. Uh, and if they still have computers at the office or they have special software running on service at the office, how to securely connect into them. Uh, one of the easiest ways to do that is using a remote control software so that you can use all of the programs on your computer at work just as though you were there. You can remotely control that computer from your computer at home. Uh, some of the common ones people know about is Log Me In, which has a free version of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, one that I'm a big fan of is called Splash Top. They're kind of a competitor to Log Me In. Once you get to like the the pro version that lets you do like remote printing and things like that. They're one of my favorite ones. Whichever one you use, one of the important things to do is I would encourage you to, first of all, of course, pick a strong password. Don't make your password password one. And then also turn on two-factor authentication, especially for this remote control software, because hackers will try to connect into those computers and will try to take advantage of them. And two-factor authentication we've talked about before, but that lets them send a text message to your phone or use an app on your phone to verify that you're actually used so someone else can't also remote into that computer. Um, So do that. One other thing I wanted to mention is for small businesses, I've had several of them. We do phone systems as well, IP phone systems and things. Mm -hmm. And one thing we can do with depending on what kind of phone system you have, a lot of companies that set up your phone system can connect remotely and set up forwarders. So when you have your normal menu play, that's what we have right now for my business, actually, is that if you call into my normal business number and hit whatever button for whatever menu, it calls whichever person it's supposed to go to in their homes. All my people are working from home right now. And, and it confuses customers, though, because they don't think they should call into the office to actually still reach us at home, but, but technology, right? But even if you don't have a, an IP phone system like that, even if you have an old-fashioned, you know, AT&T 20-year-old phone sitting at the office, you can use services like Star 72. Almost every phone provider in the, in the U.S. offers Star 72, and that's a forward always. Uh, so you just pick up the phone at the office, type in Star 72. It'll give you a dial tone. You type in your mobile phone number or your home phone number, and it rings. You have to answer that call. So someone has to be at the other end to be able to answer it when you're doing it. And then all future calls into that office number just automatically go out to whatever number you dialed. And then it's star seven, three, if you, whenever you want to cancel it. But that way, when people are calling your business, you can still be operating. Hmm. I, and really, that's something that I hadn't even considered that people would be uh, really apprehensive of calling a place of business because they know that so many places are, well, hey, shut right. down. Right. So very interesting. And, and if you're a business owner, consider doing all that stuff. Also, of course, if you haven't already, update your website, update your social media, tell people if you are open, if you're just carry out only, if you have online ordering, if you can sell gift cards in the meantime. I know a lot of small businesses trying to at least do that to have some income coming on in the meantime. And there's a lot of people trying to do that. They want to support. We have a really strong downtown group in Waynesboro where my office is, and they're selling gift cards for the downtown businesses, just trying to yeah, keep things alive, and and the community is really supportive of that. So if you offer something like that, it's a, a good time to to try and push that as well. Yeah, definitely seeing a lot of businesses, and especially uh, let's say restaurants and and things like that. That hey, you know, traditionally you did have to go into, but uh, a lot of them are doing delivery, and 
Right. And restaurants are the obvious ones where they do a lot of deliveries and curbside pickup and things like that. But even other businesses are finding other ways to be able to work. I mean, I've been talking to landscapers who can still do some things, but not others, but they don't want to go see you. They would rather have you call them and not talk to them in person when they're at. And, and it's all these kind of things that, you know, there's new regulations and how we're going to do this or how we're going to do that. Or this business is going to allow you to submit documents this way, but not that way. So, you know, update people, let them know that you're still operating and, and by what means. Do you think that uh, this whole thing, and obviously with, uh, you know, with what you're providing uh, all, all of the people who you deal with, do you think this is kind of a, a, a wake-up call to people that even if this is not how they prefer to do their business, they mm -hmm. need to have some kind of system in place that, hey, you should have a way to do business if this, you know, I'm not saying if another pandemic happens, but if your building catches fire or something, yeah. you know, something catastrophic happens. Yeah. People don't think about that. They this don't is think a good of, backup. Of having contingency plans or, or thinking about worst case scenarios. And this will bring that into the forefront. And I think just like we were talking about before, it will also result in more people being more flexible or not more flexible, but more um, willing to accept alternative things like, like remote appointments where we can do remote control or video conferencing or you know, pickups or working from home. I think a lot of that will become much more commonplace now just because people are being forced to get used to it now. Computer America is always supportive of uh, alternative lifestyles. And hey, we, <laughs> we appreciate that. So Mike, there's music playing in the background. We know that you can't hear that. TechEye.org, as always, um, yes. top, top of Computer America tech support. If you ever need anything, check out their community. It's all socially distanced. You're good to go. Hey, Mike, <laughs> until next month, thank you so much for time shifting and thank you for being on. My pleasure. Have a good one. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.